All right, and then I will begin us with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, again, as we have been talking before, uh, Bible study here today, we do uh, recognize in this uh, mortal, frail life, there are these times where we do go through loss. And when we mourn the loss of loved ones, we do so, Lord, because they made an impact on us, because we loved them and enjoyed having them uh, here with us to, to hear, to talk with, um, to do things with, to spend our time together, especially as we think about Mark, to, to sing in choir and to be part of that company. Um, and as, as uh, we remember Dale, uh, even the work that he did, especially with the uh, Lutheran Hour Ministries, uh, what a joy he had to share the gospel of Jesus with others. And uh, Lord, you found it in your um, wisdom. Uh, it was time to bring them home, to, to bring them closer to you and away from us. But Lord, in, in another way, we know that we are still connected with those people because we are connected to Jesus. And Jesus promises us uh, that gift of everlasting life that he has now granted to Mark and Don. And uh, so, Lord, we, we do mourn, but we also do give thanks and rejoice. But we do pray for especially um, spouses and children that, that they go through a, a much harder time now as they mourn their loss. And we pray, Lord, that you would enable us to walk alongside them uh, in the most loving way possible, to be with them as they grieve and as they miss their husbands, and uh, help us to have the right words to say, help us to, to be in the right moment and to share your love and your presence with them. And the Lord be with us now as we study your word and as we study how Jesus entered into this world and um, brought his healing touch and brought his power and authority to the brokenness of this world. And may we always know that he still brings that to this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, so last time we, we got into the dialogue of Jesus and this uh unclean spirit. Um, so we heard about the description. Jesus came to Gentile territory. It was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and he was immediately um, greeted by this man with unclean, with an unclean spirit, uh, who it turns out has, has many unclean spirits. And so we're into the dialogue. Um, verse 7, he cried out, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? We talked about how that language, Most High God, is is one, it's apt and fitting. God, God is the Most High God. But it's sort of a Gentile, a non-Jewish way of speaking. And so it, it, it grants... Um, uh, truthfulness to this account. Like, again, if you're going to have Jesus encounter Gentiles, they're not going to use the language of Jews because that's not in their background. They're going to use their own language. And so to refer to the one true God as the most high God, that, that's quite fitting. Uh, I adjure you by God, do not torment me. The irony there of trying to put Jesus under an oath of from God um, not to torment him, uh, that is the unclean spirit. Uh, this is similar to what happened in chapter 1 when Jesus encounters an, an unclean spirit. The unclean spirit said, have you come to destroy me? Here it's torment, kind of a, a similar thing. Um, and then Jesus was saying to him, come out of that man, you unclean spirit. Hello. Sorry. You're all right. It happens, it happens. <laughs> We're we're still we're still in the recap, so we haven't we haven't got to the the, the fresh stuff. Um, so Jesus again, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. It's just Jesus's word. This is the exorcism. Um, he doesn't have to do anything special. Um, the power of his word it simply does things, and um, to us that always has great significance because. Uh, we talk about salvation and forgiveness connected to the Word of God. And the Word of God really does that. So for us, this is why the certainty of forgiveness, the certainty of salvation, it, it's there. And it doesn't depend on, like, did I do the right thing? Am, am I good enough? 
Um, because once you start down that path, you have no certainty anymore. But the gospel isn't the gospel if there's uncertainty. Uh, it's the gospel because God's word does exactly what it says. Um, and, and here, again, even this unclean spirit, um, the spirits have more power than we do. Satan has more power than we do. But to, to Jesus and his word, they, they still are, they can't touch him. Um, they, they are nothing compared to him. So then verse 9 is the now, now the real dialogue. Jesus asked him, that is this unclean spirit or this man who has the unclean spirit, what is your name? And he, that is this man with the unclean spirit or the unclean spirit itself replied, my name is Legion for we are many. And uh, we remarked in, in Roman military, a legion is the, the name given for a unit of troops. And over the years, how the number of troops that qualified as a legion changed a little bit. But um, around this time, it was about 6,000. So this unclean spirit says, I'm not just one unclean spirit. Again, this man was just bombarded by demons. We have a lot of questions about that. Jesus and the gospel writers don't give us any any hints like how how many demons can enter a person like how how is that even possible um we we don't know any of that we just know that this guy has a force of of demons um the interesting quote that I added to our our bible study was that um at one point in time um Jesus uses the talk of legion referring not to unclean spirits but to angels to to the good guys so yeah so that was in the um arrest scene right before the trial in the garden of gethsemane uh remember the the temple guard come with with soldiers to arrest jesus they're ready for a fight uh peter draws his sword and he strikes one of them and cuts off his ear malchus uh way to be famous because your ear got cut off and jesus said hey put away your swords uh if if we were here to fight he says do you think that i cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels so again to give you some grasp of the power difference yes here is a legion of unclean spirits of demons that are possessing this man but Jesus is like, well, I could have 12 legions of angels, you know, just like that. And obviously that isn't even said to be all of them. Um, so the, the overwhelming power of, of God and of the angels, yes, to us, Satan has power. There are many demons. We don't, you know, we don't know how many, but um, God is more powerful still. And there are more uh, of his angels than of the opposite. Um, okay, so my name is Legion, for we are many. Um, and again, in, in the realm of the gospel and in life, the gospel highlights this. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. That's, that's the language of Paul. Um, but against the powers and the principalities and all of the forces of darkness. The, the thing that we don't see is that there is spiritual warfare going on all the time. And we should be cautious, um, maybe, I don't want to say scared, because again, God fights on our side, but aware of that. And we usually aren't, because again, we can't see it. But this takes a lot of different forms. And, and for us, I think that the biggest is people are never to be our enemies. Jesus hates no one. God hates no one. Um, and we sometimes have a difficulty with that. Because, again, what we can't see is that there is a spiritual war going on. And people, just like this man, are sometimes used in ways they don't understand, in ways they might, may not even be able to control. Um, and Jesus here you know, again, gives us the glimpse of there is a greater world out there 
that we can't see, that we need to acknowledge. Um, and so Jesus here has great compassion and pity on these people that are afflicted in these ways. So pity not just on people who are afflicted with um, physical diseases, but people who are afflicted by demon possession, that they are being controlled by Satan. Um, and so, again, we pray for our enemies. We pray for people that are hurtful to us, that, that mock our, our faith, our religion, um, you know, as Jesus did, even from the cross, when these soldiers were being so cruel to, the, to him, um, just constantly, you know, it wasn't enough that they whipped him, that they beat him, that they did the crown of thorns. Like, even when he's dying on the cross, they're, they're continuing to mock him. Um, and Jesus speaks words of forgiveness for them. Um, recently, I, I had a conversation with somebody who was, was friends or acquaintances with someone who believed that Jesus lived um, and, and even that he was God, but had a real problem with the idea that Jesus could forgive her. Um, and I don't think that this person was a crazy axe murderer. Um, I don't know what her sins were, but that, that feeling of, you know, I'm, I'm beyond the range of, of God's forgiveness. And again, to, to look at Jesus... There is no one that he looks at that is beyond his forgiveness. The forgiveness is for everyone. And that is a challenge that we sometimes don't live up to as Christians. Um, Jesus teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Like, even that phrase, as those who trespass against us. Like, it's, it's not saying that they were innocent. It's saying that they, they did wrong. They, they hurt us in some way. But we're to forgive those people because if forgiveness is not for people who don't deserve it, it's for no one. We, we all don't deserve it, but that's what forgiveness is. Um, and so Jesus' interactions with these people, that spiritual reality, we always want to share God's love and forgiveness, um, even to people that don't deserve it. Stephanie? Um, if it's somebody like Hitler, does that mean we forgive him? Because, is that what you're saying? Or I asked, I asked yeah. the pastor many years yeah. ago about that, and he said the only people that can forgive him mm -hmm. are the ones that he actually did something to. Mm -hmm. And the rest of us don't have that ability to forgive. Him. Well, yeah, so again, there's, there's going to be a couple levels here. So even for somebody, for Hitler, mm -hmm. we, we would pray that, that he would repent. That, that he would see what he has done and, and repent of that. Ask God for forgiveness, turn from it, and you, you, you would say, well, you no, I, I kind of... that he would repent. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. And, and you would say, well, no, I, I kind of don't want him to. I, I want him to, to suffer every, every last oh, bit. Oh, right. and, and the point is, is that's our human hearts. Mm -hmm. Even God desires that every, you know, there's more joy in heaven... For, for one sinner who repents than for the 99 that, that have no need. Um, and, and so I'm saying we want God's heart to be our heart. Mm -hmm. and, and that's very, very difficult and it's very, very challenging. Now, so that, that's one way of looking at this. Um, what that person said, okay, yes, Hit, Hitler didn't harm us specifically. So in a sense, we don't have anything to forgive him, but... That, then my point is we, we would pray for his forgiveness uh, that, that, he would, that he would turn from that and, and receive yeah. Jesus oh, as his savior. Would, that he would ask for forgiveness. You pray that he would ask for Yeah, forgiveness. yeah. That he would turn yeah. from his... I can't but, but, if, but if you're a person who was harmed by Hitler, right. that, yeah. then, again, the point still stands of... I, un I understand all of the hard feelings and everything, but what... What does you holding on to hatred for against him accomplish? 
Um, you're not his judge, so it, it's not going to change his life or anything. Um, but the gospel could potentially change his life. Uh, and, and there are stories of this, of people who have done wretched things to people and the victims' families. Again, I'm not saying that the people still shouldn't get the punishment. They did the crime. They still get the punishment. But again, theologically, they still find it in their hearts to forgive those people. And the, the people that perpetrated the crimes are like, they, they are changed by it. Not all of them, granted, but theologically, the point would be only, only the gospel can change people. Um, you holding on to hatred will do, A, nothing for them, but B, it's, it's toxic to your own soul. <laughs> hatred and anger, the Bible speaks against both of those things as, as being harmful to us. So, so now... It's not just that they harm somebody, but now we're harming ourselves by, by holding on to all of that stuff. Right. Forgiveness is saying, God, all vengeance belongs to you. So if, if that person deserves, you know, to, to suffer irreparably, I'm going to leave that in your hands to figure that out. I, I'm going to free my own right. soul it's from it. It's not our call. It's not our right. We, we have to worry about our own self. Yeah. We don't need to be judging other yeah. people right and and again i'm talking about the spiritual matters in in right. in the civil world when when people do things wrong it doesn't mean that we should let all criminals free oh, from jail or anything like that um and and again all of this is predicated on there's there's a spiritual battle happening out there so all of those bad actors they're not doing that because they know who Jesus is and they're connected to him. They knew that because they're connected to Satan. Um, and they may not acknowledge that, but it's just, it's, it's the reality. Satan is the one who seeks to destroy. He's the father of all lies. He's the one that wants to torment people, um, not God. And so we, we pray that they would see God's light, that they would be freed from that right. spiritual bondage. Um, yeah, so, so again, spirit, a spiritual reality. Jesus alerts us to that, and he has come to win that battle for us, a battle that we're even sometimes unaware of. And I think that the book of Revelation, again, this is, this is how I read it. It, it. Revelation, to me, is not a literal book. It is John is given a glimpse of a spiritual reality and so some of the stuff that's behind, you know, what, what's going on today, we can't see that there is a spiritual battle, but what the book of Revelation does, again, you read all through it, there's some pretty dark stuff there, but it reminds us that, that Jesus is the victor. He, he does win this battle, even though at times it looks like it's unwinnable for our side. Um, and so... Yeah, spiritual reality. The the gospel just it 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 shares that this is this is a reality that we don't see, but Jesus does. Um, okay, verse ten. Uh, this man with the unclean spirit, he begs him, that is Jesus, not to send them out of the country. Um, I I don't I don't know again what's be behind this, except in Luke's gospel where he has this same story. He adds. Don't just, don't send us into the abyss, um, and so that is don't send us out of this country. That is don't send us into the place where where we're going to to go. So on page five in your handout, I have that. It's at the bottom of page five. It's so again. This is the same story, but this is Luke's account of it. So right here it says, "And they, that is this legion, begged him, that is Jesus, not to command them to depart into the abyss." And then Revelation twenty. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit. Um, and that word bottomless pit is abyss. So in in Greek, it's just the word abyss, but what does abyss means? It, it means a bottomless pit. Um, so Luke 8 has the actual word abyss. Revelation 20, bottomless pit, but it's, it's the abyss. 
Um, so hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain, and he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Um, there's all sorts of stuff that goes with the thousand years. I don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole right now. Um, I just want to note... Abyss, bottomless pit seems to be a reference to that judgment, that judgment of Satan and all of his demons. So here, begging Jesus not to send them out of the country, if we take Luke's gospel and, and read that part of the story, it's don't, don't send us to that place of final judgment. Let, let us still you know, roam around and cause havoc and hurt people and, and that sort of thing. Um, they, they honestly weren't in a good position to beg. I mean, Jesus doesn't need to do anything for them. But um, ne nevertheless, they're, they're at their last straw, so they're going to try. Verse 11, a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. Um, again, there's more questions I have than are answered in this. Um, demons so we we typically associate them with with entering to people can, can they enter animals too uh, i mean apparently because they ask that um that that's all sorts of weird to us but again i i guess it, it's part of satan's power um so this this kind of fits in with Satan and, and his, his forces do have power that we don't understand. And, and so do, can they have power over animals? Can they have power over nature? So, you know, again, we know that God does, but, but sometimes, just like in the case of Job, um, God lets Satan do things, but he, he always, there, there's a line, Satan can only do so much God restricts him. So can Satan cause havoc? Um, hurricanes, tornadoes, these forces of natural destruction. We in our lives certainly don't like to think of God as the author of these things. Um, again, he controls all of it. We get that. But, you know, that he causes these kinds of destruction. Th this might be a sense where we understand Satan does have some control over the natural world. Um, he, if he can enter into pigs and, you know, can he control them and, you know, do, do things with them? Um, again, there's so much we don't know about that spiritual world. We should have a healthy respect for that. To me, this means that they, they really did not care for pigs. You know, they were an unclean animal and sending them... Mm -hmm. You know, the spirits into an mm -hmm. unclean animal was really a, a degradation to them. You know, they, mm -hmm. they really were, that was as low as you could go. But they're mm -hmm. asking to do it. Why do they want to go to a lower place? Well, they were still alive then. Yeah, I, I mean... It, but the pigs ran into the ocean or the sea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, themselves. yeah. It, well, and, and again, it, it, there's, there's, so many, <laughs> there's so many questions... Yeah. And and I don't I don't have the answers because all we have is is this account and it's just it's pretty matter of fact like it's just an everyday ordinary thing. Today would they don't send me into those homeless people you know don't send me into those bums. Yeah. Um, so in in a from a Jewish perspective, again, a cemetery is an unclean place. Jew, Jews wouldn't hang out in a cemetery, um, but this man was. Because the unclean spirits, they, they will hang around in that place. And so there is certainly some connection of, well, pigs to a Jew are an unclean animal. So the demons still are choosing to, to stay like in their unclean space. So um, from that sense, it, you know, maybe not a, a degradation of them, but hey, we're, we're still staying in our territory. We're not going to bother you people. Um, you know, I, I, I don't I don't really know. Um, but here you go. Demon possession into into pigs because Jesus says he, he gave them permission. What could have been worse for them than the pigs? Uh, the abyss. 
Just the yeah, abyss. That, well, yeah, that, the, the, final, the final destruction, I guess. Um, we don't know... So, the, the, the other option is, like, just let us roam, roam around free, but Jesus doesn't appear to want to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd numbering about 2,000. So, again, remember, this, this unclean spirit referred to itself as legion, which could be up to 6,000. Um, well, we know they were at least 2,000, because there's 2,000 pigs, and they take over all of the pigs. So because that man had multiple demons in him, there certainly could have been three, four unclean spirits per pig. Um, I guess that, was, that, that could work. He was in bad shape. <laughs> he, he, was, he was in very bad shape. Um, and now the pigs are in bad shape because they rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. And, and this, this is a question that's kind of related to the question of this man. So this man, we learned that um, he would cut himself and he's always crying out. And I don't really know when he's crying out, is it the unclean spirit that, that's doing that? When he's cutting himself, is it the unclean spirit that's doing that? And is it trying to destroy and torment the physical, that, that man? Um, or is the man doing that and he's trying to, to destroy himself to be free from these demons? Well, it makes me think of the, of, you know how a pig squeals? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can understand yeah. how, if he's cutting himself and it's actually yeah. hurting the demons. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's, I don't know. Well, he is talking to the spirit. Yes. Yeah. Saying, come out of the man, you want yeah. spirit. Yeah. It, it, it's really, it's so, again, I, it's, I don't want to say that this is the same because it's not always. But people that suffer from uh, addictions, um, whether it's alcohol or drugs, I mean, the, the, those are common ones. There are, there are many kinds of addictions. I don't want to make the jump that says all addiction is demon possession or anything like that. But there is a, a similarity in the sense that an addiction is a slavery to a, a, a thing that it's, it's kicked your butt. You, you lack the ability to say no. You lack the ability to stop you know, doing what you're doing. Again, I do know some people are able to break addictions and, and whatnot. Other people, they just, you know, their whole life, they, they are always going to be battling that even when they seek help. It controls you where you should control it. Right. And so um, some of those people that struggle with that, they enter into these cycles of self-destruction. And, and sometimes it's, it's just sort of like they feel so helpless, they just want to be dead. They, because you know that's the only that's the only time that they think that there will be any sort of freedom, and and so the comparison I'm trying to make is is that man feel like that, um, you know did the people that were trying to bind him um, were they actually trying to help him from like being hurt by this demon or hurting himself you know I I don't really know and the man just couldn't control himself. Um, because this demon was doing it. I, I, again, I, I don't know who is in control or if it was at different times, different. I know ultimately the man didn't want these demons, but he couldn't remove the demons from himself. So ultimately he did not have any control. The reason why I wonder that is because the pigs, did the demons steer the pigs or did the pigs steer the demons? Did, did the pigs destroy themselves to get, get these demons away from us? Or was it the demons that did that? The thing that doesn't make sense to me if the demons did it is what happens after they, the pigs die? The, the demons have lost their host, so they do they go to the abyss anyway? Um, and do they go on to, to find somebody else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, again, I'm answering a string of unanswerable questions. So it's like conjecture upon conjecture, because if the demons were in control and they destroy the pigs so that they will be free, like that wasn't part of the deal. So I don't think Jesus was going to let them just do this. And now they, 
I, I think they would go into judgment. Um, I think that they would be eternally bound um, because, again, Jesus, Jesus is power and authority. And so I wonder, this is, this is part of the spiritual battle and spiritual warfare. They, don't know, they know Jesus's power, but they don't know Jesus's ways. Satan does not understand the gospel. He, he cannot, like he just, he, he literally cannot understand that. Um, and so did the demons think that they were outwitting Jesus, but what they didn't realize is that Jesus had outwitted them. And again, sure, destroy the pigs, but you're not going to enter anybody else. Um, you, you will be destroyed. Um, the other thing, and again, we're, we're, we're just making all sorts of connections. Do you remember the previous story before this was the, the storm on the sea? And in the in not just the Jewish world, but in in many different civilizations, the sea and the waters were connected with a spiritual power. Um, so, for instance, the the one you might know is uh, in the Greek world, Poseidon. Poseidon was the god of the sea, um, and Poseidon was not the high god. Zeus was the high god, uh, and there was always you know constant battles and whatever between all of these gods. Um, and so these unclean spirits, they drown, but now they're more closely associated again with the sea. And the sea is a place of spiritual power um, and darkness as well. So do, do they join that? And, you know, I, I, I don't know, but all of that stuff would be in the people's imaginations because... They, they associate these things together, just like pigs, unclean. Well, sure, it would make sense that unclean spirits would want to go to unclean animals, but the, the, the jumping into the sea, that's sort of like, didn't see that coming. Um, so, oh yeah, it, it, this is, this is, it's such a fascinating story and fascinating because I don't know the answer to most of this. Um, and so that is that reminder of... There's a spiritual realm that I don't know nearly enough about, but but Jesus has conquered it. Jesus is more powerful than that, so stay close to Jesus. Um, oh, by the way, these pigs, they had a herdsman. <laughs> they had somebody that, that yeah. some people that took care of them. So verse 14 says, the herdsman fled and told it in the city and in the country. Um, that is, hey, all of our pigs just, just ran into this, to the sea and, and drowned themselves like lemmings. Um, people came to see what it was that had happened. Um, I don't know how much time is passing in these verses. Because uh, again, in, in one sense, we've lost track of, is it day? Is it the morning? Is it the evening? Jesus probably left the sea teaching in the evening. He had taught all day. He was tired. They get in the boat. They're going to go to the other side. It, it would not... It shouldn't have taken all night to get across the sea. Um, again, you can see from one side to the other. This is it's bigger than Lake Harris, but you know, again, a couple of hours you should be able to do that. But then that storm came. That would have messed things up. Um, but it, it's either it's either nighttime or the beginning of the day. You know, I, I don't think it's the evening when they got to the other side of the shore because the guy sees them. And it would have been hard to see who's coming ashore and all of that. Again, we said the unclean spirits maybe would have been aware of what was happening. Um, Jesus is coming. Watch out. I, you know, I don't, I don't really know. But in verse 14, when the herdsmen fled and told them the city and the country, some time needs to pass in order for him to tell all of these people um, what, what had happened. And then some time needs to pass for them to now make their way to Jesus. So I don't know how long they're hanging out on the beach shore here, but um, yeah, some some amount of time had to have passed. But by verse 15, these people come to Jesus and they saw the demon-possessed man. So they're all well aware of this guy and how crazy he is. And, you know, we, we send him away or he's, he's here in the, the, the cemetery, the graveyard. Um, they know all about him. And it, again, says the one who had the legion, doesn't anymore. And now he's sitting there, he's clothed, so he must have been naked before, or at least wearing his underwear, uh, and he's in his right mind. Before he wasn't. He, he was out of control. 
Um, and so what happens? They were afraid. So they hear the story. They want to see the proof. They see the proof now. There are no more pigs, but here's this guy. And, you know, maybe his hair is combed. You know, he, he looks nice. And you can have a conversation with him. And that's never happened before. So what's your response to that? They fall at his feet and worship him, right? That's what you would want. That's what you would expect. So now we have two stories in a row like this. Because that was the same thing that happened with the disciples when he calmed the storm. When he calmed the storm, do you remember that? It said the disciples were afraid. They were more afraid of Jesus than they were of the storm. And we talked about that and said there is a place where fear is a part of faith. And you recognize, again, God is God and you're not. And, you know, we... We need to recognize his authority. And so fear is one way of talking about that. It's not cowering fear. It's, it's that respect. It's that reverence. But is that what the disciples were feeling in that moment was, was reverence? Or were they like, this guy is uncontrollable. Like, he, he just speaks and, and this happens. That's the same kind of response that these people are having um, they're, they're not bowing down and worshiping him. And just in case you're not sure, they're going to ask Jesus to leave. So if, if, if this kind of fear was a fear that leads to faith, then they would want Jesus to be with them. The only one in this story that's going to want to be with Jesus other than the disciples is that, mm -hmm. that man. So they're afraid of Jesus because of what he has done with this demon-possessed man and the unclean spirits and the pigs. And so, again, we're, we're thinking of how everything ties back together. They're like the scribes. Do you remember the scribes that came from Jerusalem? Well, it's by the power of Beelzebul that you cast out the unclean spirits and the demons. It's because you're in league with Satan that you can do this. And Jesus, you know, again, yeah, crazy. said, he said, that's crazy. And the image that he used was of a strong man and only one who can bind a strong man can plunder his house. And again, here was an encounter with a strong man who nobody else could bind. Jesus is like fulfilling that parable literally now, granted, these people did not hear the parable, but his disciples did. Um, and so his disciples are, are holding on to all of this information. Um, but what they do have is not the parable, but the reality. And so in their own brains, they do need to process this. Who could be stronger than a legion of demons? Again, there can only be two answers. It's either the commander of the demons, that is Satan, the devil, or God himself. And what, whatever their answer is, they say, get out of here. We don't, we don't want you here. Um, so who is it that they thought was among them? I, I think if, if they thought it was God, they, they would have asked him to do more miracles Again, what happened in Galilee when Jesus did things? People started bringing more and more sick people, more and more demon-possessed people. They wanted him to do that for them. So what's the difference in the response? One thing is clearly he's not in Jewish territory. He's in Gentile territory. So whereas the Jews have, at least in their background, you know, God and his mercies and the Messiah and, and, you know, God will come to deliver us. They have all of that. The Gentiles don't. They don't have the Old Testament. They, they know about gods. They know about gods as powerful beings, as sort of tyrannical sometimes. They do their own thing. Um, gods, they're petty. Basically, gods have all of the characteristics that humans do, good and bad, except they don't die because they're spirits. Um, and so they, they have a different set of experiences and knowledge. And um, we have to kind of keep this in mind, I think, because we're in a weird place. 
where there's a lot of familiarity, like on a very superficial level with Christianity in, in our world. And, and we sort of take for granted, like everybody has to know about Jesus, right? Um, because again, it, it's just, it's, how can you not? Um, it, there's so much of our culture and history, even if people aren't Christian, like there's just stuff that they should know. Um, but then when we share different parts of our faith or our life with them, uh, I think we sometimes assume too much on the part of people. And, and those assumptions, we, they, they may not get it completely. Um, again, somebody that's been very hurt in their life um, and, and knows or believes that there's a God out there and that God is all powerful. Um, and you say, hey, Jesus loves you. They're like, yeah, uh, he, he doesn't love me because of all that bad stuff that he let happen. If he really loved me, that, that wouldn't be there. So we, we say what you know we think is a good message and a positive message, and it's certainly a true message, but through their own filter, they, they may not hear what it is that we want to convey. Um, I think Jesus came to do good among these people. Why were they not able to receive it as a good thing? Well, one big reason is 2,000 pigs would be a big amount of money, a big amount of one's livelihood. And food. And food. Uh, and, and now it's all gone. Are they, they going to go fish those animals out of the water? And, you know, what food's uh, that do you? Yeah. What waterlogged bacon? I, it, so it's possessed by the demon. Yeah, yeah. So Jesus came and he brought great deliverance for this man. But these people, some of them, lost lost money. There was economic um, hardship, uh, food potentially. So they see Jesus coming, and it it wasn't all daisies and roses. It, it came at a great cost to them, and to others we're sharing a gospel message and it might be the best message in the world but it might come at a cost to them and uh, you're talking a, a livelihood to all these people mm -hmm. for one man mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah yeah and and so some, sometimes you start to understand why the gospel might not be uh greeted so favorably yeah. um especially you know again Maybe not our world thinks so much, but think of a worse situation, a, a place where the gospel is foreign and, and they persecute people that, that believe in the gospel. Well, okay, by, by telling me this good news and you wanting me to believe it, you're saying that I should put myself at risk from persecution, from loss of job, loss of life. Um, no, I don't think so. Move, move, move along. Um, so... The gospel always is for all people, but you start to understand why first to the Jews, because they were prepared for it. They, they knew about it. To the Gentiles, there's, there's some work that's probably going to need to happen there. Um, and, and Paul, in his missionary journeys, he, he had to do some of that work, and he was still just planting seeds, he said. Uh, it, it, it may not happen. For us as Christians today, um, I, I, I really do think, and I'm speaking first to myself before I'm speaking to you, trust me, um, we've lost some of that missionary zeal ourselves. Mm -hmm. we, we like comfort. We want to be comfortable. Um, and we associate that comfort with God's blessings. And absolutely, without God's blessings, there wouldn't be any comfort at all. But again... Maybe we should be more uncomfortable. Maybe we should be willing to take on a little bit more um, for our faith so that the, the world, you know, the world sees that you can live in a, in a world where you might be harmed by others, but the hope of Jesus is still a greater promise and a greater reward than anything in this world. In Jesus' own words, seek first the kingdom of God, and all things shall be added to you. Store up your treasures in heaven, not here, where rust will destroy, will moth will eat. What does the world have to offer me after I die? Mm -hmm. I'm dead. Yeah. That's it. And, and frankly, what does the world have to offer us right now? Yeah. It, 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 nothing that lasts. 
yeah. pain and yeah. sickness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Gentile, this, this Gentile group, they're, they're not having the same reaction that the Jews did. And, and so I think that's one of the reasons that they have different understandings. But when Jesus healed people, there, there wasn't really a great cost. Here there was. They, they lost 2,000 pigs on this day. Um, and, and that's a pretty terrible thing for them. Um, and, and then also, it's just so interesting. Do you remember what the story was in Mark's gospel just before the scribes said that Jesus was possessed by a demon? What was the story that was immediately before it? Was that the mustard seed? Nope, nope. It was his family who had come and they wanted to shut him up. Why? Because he's out of his mind. So here, note the difference between Jesus's family who thought he was out of his mind and then Jesus encounters somebody who really is out of his mind. And what's the resolution to it? He's clothed and in his right mind. Jesus is able to make people in their right minds. So, so again, the, both the scribes and Jesus' family, like they completely misunderstand him. And the proof is in this story. He, he not only has the power over the strong man, but far from being crazy, Jesus himself makes those who are out of their minds to be sane and normal again through his power um so again it's just when you read it closely and you you see these connections like i don't think that's an accident mark tells these stories and all of these things are sort of drawn together all right verse 16 those who had seen it that is this whole thing of jesus casting out the unclean spirits them going into the pig Um, They described to them what had happened both to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. So that they were afraid and they want him to leave. And as he was getting into the boat, that is Jesus, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he, this, this man who formerly had the demons, that he might be with him. And that's the language of the apostles. So remember, Jesus has a great crowd of people, and he calls from the crowd 12, and those 12 are going to be the apostles. He's going to send them out. He hasn't yet actually sent them out. That's still to come, because before he sends them out, he says, first, I want you to be with me. So when this man asked to be with Jesus, like that's that language of not only does he want to be a, a crowd follower, but he wants to be a close disciple and and even an apostle with Jesus. Now, Jesus is going to say no to him because Jesus' own apostles, he chose them. The language is very specific on that. He's the one that chose the apostles. So the apostles weren't the ones who said to Jesus, hey, we want to be among the elite, the, the few. Jesus is the one that chose them, and he did that out of his grace. Um, it wasn't that they were more equipped. Again, the apostles were not well equipped. They, they screwed it up all the time. It was out of his grace that he chose them. Here, this man, he wants to choose for himself to, to be this one. And Jesus says, no. However, the 12 apostles, again, who were not there yet, but they will be sent in Jesus' name, this man is still sent in Jesus's name. So in a way, he's still, he's not, he's never called an apostle, but just the action, Jesus will send him now and say, no, I don't want you to go with me, but instead you go and tell people what the Lord has done for you. So in a sense, he, he does end up getting the end result of what would come from being with Jesus. Because to be with Jesus is ultimately going to mean that Jesus is going to send you out. Um, All of the disciples, they get sent out. The Great Commission, go forth and make disciples of all nations. Um, And to this day, the the same thing. So here is a little mini um, 
yeah, a little little mini commissioning, a little mini apostleship, discipleship. Um, it's interesting to us. We would say again, well, why? Why did Jesus not let him come with? Well, it's because of this. If he comes with Jesus, who's there to tell the story? Oh, he needs to tell. Well, the people who didn't like Jesus yeah. and, and wanted him to go away. This man receives Jesus for who he is. He's the only one that could be a true witness for Jesus. Um, and, and so that's, that's sort of what, what's going to happen. Um, okay, five minutes. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home, dear friends, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Um, so much to say there, but this, this really is what it's all about. Um, our own witness of, of who, we, who we are as Christians is how much the Lord has done for us. And uh, Jesus, Jesus has done all things for us. That's, that's the most important thing. But in our own lives, there are small mercies of God that we can all point to. And none of those mercies, none of the stories will ever be the same. Um, they might be similar. Uh, I was talking with somebody about this yesterday. Um, she was talking about a testimonial that somebody gave. And it was one of those, you know, like, wow, they went from this and now they're like, and she's talking about like, you know, her story wasn't really like that. She grew up in a Christian family and, you know, she never ever felt like she wasn't a Christian, but then there was a time in her life when it became more real to her. And I said, well, I don't even have that. I grew up, you know, in a Christian family and I can't ever tell you a time when I, I never was a Christian and, and it, you know, wasn't real. But at the same time, I may not have any like huge mountaintop moments, you know, that, but it's just, it was always a constant thing. Um, and I said, and it's good that not all stories are the same because I can't really associate with that one guy's story. And I'm like, well, if that's what it's like to be a Christian, I need to go out and sin some more so I can have a dramatic conversion and a come to Jesus moment. Um, but no, I don't think that's what God's calling me to do. Instead, see, you know, our stories are different. Well, now this man's story, probably nobody's going to have a story like him. But the point will be how much God has done for him. And if God can do that for him, well, then regular old, you know, Joseph, me, uh, he, he can do much through me and for me. All the things I've done in my life, you know, they, it, it, it mm -hmm. really is washed away. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's what counts is now. Yep. Yeah. Where my faith is, where I believe. Why am I still here? Why am I in a Bible study this yeah. morning? Yeah. Why do I go to church on Sundays? Why do I look forward to going to church mm -hmm. on Sunday? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because God does so much for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so if you want to know what witnessing is, it's not me, 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 me. It's mm -hmm. him, 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 him. Yeah. So our our language is is focused on him. So the guy goes away. He begins to proclaim in the Decapolis. Again, that's this greater region of Greek cities, how much Jesus had done for him. So not just God, but Jesus. And you sort of see Jesus is the Lord because tell him how much the Lord has done for you. He, he, Jesus isn't speaking about how much God up there has done, but I am the Lord. So again, there's like an, uh, his identity being revealed there. Um, and everyone marveled. Everyone marveled. And it's unclear whether that marveling is, what, the, what does that lead to? It's not fear, so that's good. Um, but they're like, they probably have questions. We have a lot of questions. Who is this Jesus? Um, all because of this guy. All right, well, I will wrap that up with, um, with that. Uh, I, I, yeah. Um, next week... Uh, is I'm going to still be here. I don't know if you'll be here. Uh, we have another long story. So this one was about 20 verses. The next one is 20 verses. And we're going to have next week, and then we'll be gone for two weeks, if my calendar is right. So the first two weeks in July. Um, I want to try to do something a little bit different next week because of that. Still, we're still going to be reading, but I'm going to give you the handout, and this is the full section of it. Um, and the next story is, it's, 
one story, but it's two stories. And when you read it, you'll see. But it's one story and it's two stories. And so next week, I'm going to come not with all of the answers um, and a study guide. I want to see, just like Jesus had his disciples be with him for a while and then he sends them out. I, I want you guys to kind of lead through the Bible study. You don't have to have all of the answers because I don't have all of the answers. I'm more interested on how do you how do you read it? What sort of questions will you ask as we get to it? And again, even if you don't know all of the answers, like what sort of things do you want to know? What's you know what sort of connections do you see? And the point isn't to show off and to have all of the answers or whatever. Um, rather, I'm trying to reverse the teacher-student mode and just see what what have you learned from me and how I how I read, and are you starting to ask some of those questions? So um, I'm in a sense putting you to the test. I'm also just again changing it up a little bit because um, we're in one week. We're not we're not going to cut that. We're not going to finish that story. Um, but we can at least begin it, and then when we come back in two weeks, I'll. I'll lead you through it, and and we'll go deeper in it. But um, I'm I'm just interested in hearing hearing you work through it because you don't learn unless you do. And I do a lot of doing for you guys. You also do. You, I mean, you ask questions. You have insights that I didn't have. But I'm gonna put you more in the driver's seat next week. So don't not come because of that. <laughs> it's it's not meant to embarrass. It's meant to sharpen the sword. All right. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your time with us. Uh, we know, Lord, that you are always with us, but we feel especially close as we study your word because it is your word, and we know that you speak to us in it and your Holy Spirit uh, strengthens us. It is the living word of God. And we pray, Lord, that through this time, uh, we are growing stronger in our faith and growing deeper in our love for you and for one another. Um, as we heard this story, Lord, help us to be like that demon-possessed man, that we would be living our lives every single day as your witnesses, uh, telling what you have done for us and of your great mercy for us, that other people would know that and that they too would marvel and rejoice and come to faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, till next week.